Hello there. Uh, I'm Zbigniew Andrzejewski, and I will have a pleasure to talk to you about uh, memory optimization in Unity, uh, especially in terms for repairing your memory uh, in your game. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, that's the agenda. So I will present myself to you uh, at, at the first time. And uh, then I will say the topics that I will and I won't cover at this presentation, so we will know uh, actually what to expect. Then we will go through some notions to define uh, define them, uh, so we will know what we are going actually uh, be talking about, uh, including memory leaks and uh, garbage collector in Unity C Sharp. And I will also say something about mono behaviors uh, in Unity, what is going to happen to them when you actually destroy a scene and or destroy um, or destroy such mono behavior uh, existing on a scene. And uh, then I will go to the tools I use to profile memory and to fix memory leaks uh, in games. And then I will go uh, through a lot of examples. Uh, there I try to simplify them. Uh, you will see. Uh, I will also say something about uh, native objects in uh, Unity C Sharp uh, that you can create from code. Um, and I will also say a few words about uh, external plugins and the risks you take when you include them in your project. Okay, so I, uh, I am Zbyszek, uh, Zbigniew Andrzejewski. I worked as a Unity developer for uh, more than five years. Uh, I used to work for Crunching Koala, so a Warsaw-based studio in uh, uh, specializing in publishing and porting games. And I also work for Draw Distance uh, as partially AI programmer, and also uh, I was responsible for porting the game in terms of um, in terms of platform functionalities, uh, but also memory and general optimization. And for at least half of these games, I had to work on some optimizations of memory, so that's why I think I can talk about this topic. Uh, and the platforms uh, that we ported included not only uh, the modern consoles, but also the mobile ones. Okay, I think you will be profitable from the stock if you are especially a Unity programmer and uh, you have to port your games for consoles or mobiles and you have some crashes without reproduction uh, that you can find because these are the most common reasons actually uh, some uh, some kind of reason that you can think that uh, may lead to memory leaks and I will assume that you have some knowledge about coding in Unity because uh, the talk will not cover the uh, simple definitions. Yeah, I won't talk about assets optimization, for example, reducing the size of your assets uh, and textures or merging mentions to uh, reduce draw costs. Uh, I, will, I won't also dive deep into assets management in your games, and the solutions I will, uh, I will provide um, won't go outside of Unity because they are Unity and C -sharp specific. Okay, so let's go for a memory uh, leak definition. I searched for some definition that I could find in, uh, in the internet uh, because I wanted to know how people think about memory leaks and what they actually are. So I, uh, I found some, uh, some of them and I typed them here. So let's quickly go to them. Uh, so on uh, Wikipedia, uh, uh, there is told that a memory leak is a type of resource leak that occurs when a computer program incorrectly manages memory allocation. And also uh, when we store something and we cannot access it. I can actually agree with that. It's a quite a good, uh, good definition, but I will also add something to that definition when, uh, when I'm going to say what I think actually what is a memory leak in your game. I found some other definition uh, that memory leak occurs when programmers create a memory in heap and forget to delete it. Well, it's quite true, but most in C++, uh, not in C Sharp, because you can specifically delete objects, uh, manage objects in C Sharp. Uh, you actually won't do that because you have garbage collectors, so I wouldn't think of memory leak uh, in such way. Uh, 
another one, a memory leak is a dynamically allocated block of memory that has no pointers pointing to it anywhere in the data space of the program. Uh, well, this also won't go for, for the Unity C sharp because we don't have as strict pointers. We don't think in terms of pointers when we create code in C sharp. We should actually know what happens uh, beneath the program, but well, I wouldn't also go for that. And uh, the last one uh, I have found is allocated memory that cannot be used because the reference to it has been lost. Well, it's not enough, actually. <laughs> so we have some knowledge about the definition of, uh, of a memory leak. So we are a little wiser. Uh, and I also found a definition that is on the Unity page that you can find. And this is actually about reasons of memory leaks. Uh, and they said that memory leak happened because of one of two issues. An object is not released manually from memory to the code, which will fit for the native object that you create from code. And an object stays in memory because of an unintentional anti reference. And that's actually true. So we gathered some definitions, and I will say the one that I will use for, uh, for the purpose of this presentation. So we've got the definition. and. For me, memory leak happens when we create resources like assets or class instances, so class in instances meaning objects, of course, fail to be released when they're no longer needed. And this leads to deterioration of application efficiency and eventually to application crash because uh, of the lack of, your, of the memory in your game. And, uh, there is something that might be suspicious for you, because I use the notion of class instances. But we're using C-sharp, so we have a garbage collector. So uh, many of Unity programmers don't think of that they have to care about your memory, uh, about your managed memory, because the garbage collector will take care of it. And well, actually, uh, I happen a lot of such, uh, I happen to find a lot of such thinking in uh, another uh, Unity developers. But if it would be true, I, I wouldn't be here uh, talking about memory optimization. So no, <laughs> that's, not, uh, that's not everything uh, the, that you might know about memory in Unity. There's a lot more beneath that, that and uh, as a Unity programmer, it's good to have that knowledge. Yeah, but we have also some other methods. Uh, when you have to cope with crashes for your game, you can search for, uh, for sources uh, online, and you can find a lot of solutions like, well, use resource unload and use assets, or well, use GC collect, or stuff like that. It's also not enough. It's, it's good to know what happens beneath, uh, beneath these methods. So when you invoke them. Uh, so this one actually unloads assets that are not used. And asset is unused, uh, is um, thought of being unused, if it isn't reached after walking the whole game object hierarchy. So these are only the objects that you can find on your scene, that you can find on your scene, including strip components. However, the script execution stack is not examined. So uh, if you store only a reference in your, uh, in your code and it's not exposed to the editor, well, it might be unloaded. But it also cares about assets, actually. So you can uh, load your asset through as a bundle. And uh, you can use a more modern approach in Unity, which is addressables. And addressables work that way that when you load one object from, from the pack of addressable, actually you have a reference to all of them. Uh, you can load them partially as assets, but you can't unload them partially as assets. And this one won't save you from memory leaks. It will unload your assets, of course. This is uh, what is it is designed for, but it won't save you. And we can also find another solution, like use GC Collect. Well, that's also not enough, of course. It's not some magical tool and some magical solution uh, that uh, C-Sharp uh, will provide to you. Uh, well, it's useful, of course, to invoke this uh, by ourselves, because uh, 
will have it invoked when we want it, and not when the memory will say that we need uh, another space inside it. But it's also not enough. So let's pro provide you uh, with some other notions. And uh, these are native and managed objects. So Unity Engine is C++ based. Uh, so when you, when you look for the sources, if you can find them, uh, but well, you can't actually, uh, you will see that everything is C++ based. So when you create some managed object, they also have the C++ representation. And it's good to remember that uh, because uh, these are actually all Unity engine objects that uh, the, um, the engine will provide you, uh, like game objects, mono behaviors, meshes, script, script table objects, textures, audio clips, and so on. Yeah, and we also have some pure managed code, like we have, some, uh, we have to write some C sharp algorithm, or we use some external libraries that don't use Unity engine objects. Um, yeah, and. I also want to say about something that is important in terms of thinking about both and manage and native objects. And this is that um, Unity Engine Object Destroy method frees only C++ objects. So when you use that, only the C++ version of this object you, you think of is deleted and the uh, memory resource is uh, freed. But C Sharp 1, the managed object, is left to be released by garbage collector. So it's not destroyed and this at the same moment as, uh, as you use C sharp destroy method. Yes, let's also say something about garbage collector. Like I said, it's not anything magical. It's a, uh, also a technical solution that it's good to know about how is it working. Um, yeah, and when you invoked uh, garbage collector dot collect, it cleans objects that aren't referenced, but some objects might still be referenced, and uh, we will say something more about it later. Yeah, and when you look for more information about garbage collector uh, online or in Unity resources, it is mostly discussed in context of creating garbage on a frame basis. Uh, in terms of optimization, in terms of uh, your FPS of your game. For example, when you combine strings, objects, frame by frame in a suboptimal way, you can generate a lot of garbage on a frame to frame basis. But you can find actually a lot of resources uh, that will say you about how it actually works. And uh, I would like you to know that bef before we go to another part of the presentation. So, uh, like I said, uh, GC collects the objects when, uh, when it is needed. It can be managed automatically when you try to store another object on a heap uh, and you don't have any more uh, memory that you can put this object on. The GC will try to find what by releasing, uh, releasing the memory. But you actually don't want that because it uh, raises, might raise a, a spike on your game and it won't be performant and you don't want to make it happen in the middle of a level, for, for example. Uh, so it's actually better to have control on that and use it, for example, during loading a level when uh, not any player might expect that something important uh, is going to happen. And there's also another option, the uh, notion that uh, I will provide you with a uh, definition on another slide, and it's GC handle. It's actually a structure uh, that corresponds to any managed C sharp object that you have in your code. And it's used, for example, to prevent garbage collector from collecting a managed object. It has some types that actually might be used by garbage collector, like weak reference or standard reference or uh, one that might prevent you from uh, changing the place of this object in your memory. We don't have access to that, and the garbage collector uh, handles this automati automatically. We can, we can find the GC handles in the memory uh, if you want, but mostly we don't want to. And uh, it happens like that, that GC stores references to GC handles, 
And these structures, GC handles, are another reference to your, to your managed C sharp objects. And this is uh, this structure is used to keep track of such managed objects. And there's also one uh, another notion that I would like you to know before we go to, to the problems and the solutions. And it is said that Mono GC handles cycle references, but actually in Unity case, it's apparently not always true. And this is actually what this talk is about. It's about cycle references that might happen in your code from um, a valid types of, uh, of reasons. And what I mean by saying cycle reference is, is provided on this, uh, on this slide. It's like one object references to another and another and another. And some, somewhere in the middle of this code, there's a loop that you can find by, uh, by references. Yeah, and you might think that C sharp objects are just some small parts of code, some small objects that are not really important. Because when you think about memory optimizations, you might think that you have a lot of textures, you have a lot of meshes, you have a lot of huge objects that uh, are stored in a memory. But it really is important, actually, to take care of uh, for also um, about uh, managed objects. And uh, I provided you uh, an example. So for example, we let's imagine that we have some UA manager that stores a reference to encyclopedia, because you have a, a huge RPG games uh, with a lot of definitions about your world and, uh, th that you created, about characters and stuff like that. So we have this encyclopedia. Encyclopedia has entries, and uh, entries have keys and values. And all these keys and values stores huge strings that are stored to show you uh, these definitions and these uh, this notions that you, you want uh, to read about. And actually, all these strings might sum up to a huge number uh, at some point, because you had a lot of these uh, definitions. So if you, if you have such a, a reference, well, it's not a cycle, but reference three, and for some reason, the encyclopedia is not released, and it can't be released, you end up with a lot of strings stored uh, in a memory indefinitely. So this is really, really important, actually. So let's go to tools, uh, for tools. We have some notions now provided, and uh, I want to also say something about the tools I used to, uh, to search for leaks and fix them. We can use Unity CPU Provider and look for allocations, of course, but it's rather for fixing performance and not memory. But actually, though Unity uh, has it working a memory provider, I find, I find another tool much more important and useful for fixing that. And the tool is Heap Explorer. Uh, it's written by Peter Schlatt, who, whom I can't thank enough <laughs> because actually he made my work much, much, and a lot of easier. Uh, and it is uh, a tool that is download that you can download as Unity package uh, on more modern version that you probably use uh, in Unity. And there's one important thing about it: it is you don't have to profile uh, your memory on a. If you search for leaks, you actually don't have to profile uh, your memory on a target platform like your console, or Switch, or PS4 or PS5. PC will be su sufficient. Pro probably, if you have a memory leak, you can find it on PC. And it's really important because uh, making bid for console is a lot, lot longer than for PC most of the time. But remember, don't use it uh, for editor because editor stores much more information that you would need to actually. And uh, it's not clear to find a solution when you, pro when you mm, try to look for it in the editor. So uh, I would like also to say something about how to actually start searching for memory leak. Let's imagine a situation when uh, you have your game, you play it for two hours or so, and you've got a crash. And how you can find it, actually? Well, sometimes it's a crash that is quite simple, and uh, it's 
in the specific place of code, you can find it, fix it, and well, it's done. But if you search for mem memory leak, probably it's not one place that leaks. You can find a lot of places that leaks. Uh, and you have to think about your game, what happens the most often, and what is the most repeatable thing that you can find in your game. So think of a measurable, often repeated process in your game that might lead to a leak and therefore to a crash. Uh, the most common one is unloading and loading scenes. You might have a game that has only one scene and uh, you have assets that are loaded uh, or process when you when you travel through your world. But a lot of Unity games has a lot of scenes. And actually, when you unload load them, you might uh, end up with, uh, with the leaked memory. And this is the most common reason for memory leak from my experience. But there might be another one. For example, you have your, a lot of UI in your game. You might turn it on and off. And each time you do that, there's something that is leaked in your memory. It might be interactions. Every time you interact with your DAW or try to pick up or collect any object, you might end up with a leak. Maybe you have a lot of AIs uh, in your game, and uh, you don't have a leak when you just load and unload the level, but you have the game crashes, for example, when you AI try to kiss you. Uh, when it turns into combat mode. So you might think that maybe there's a leak in your repeatable thing, which is your uh, AI turning into combat mode. And there's another one that, uh, a lot of other one examples, uh, you might go more to them uh, when, I, uh, when I provide you with styles on my Twitter. <laughs> so let's go to another topic. Uh, when you think about your game, in terms what might actually leak, you have to collect the data. And um, you, to collect the data, you have to take memory snapshots. And it's important to take them extremely consistently, because when you work with, with memory snapshots, uh, the easiest way to find the problem is to compare the snapshots. Uh, for example, I have this cycle for, for one of my games. So I uh, started the game, and uh, the main menu is loaded. Then I started a new game. Then I went back to main memory, because some systems are loaded only the first time. And then I go to then skipping the levels, trying to search the memory that happened um, when you reload scene. So we've got some snapshots. And each time I think that I fix something, I take the same, the same snapshots in the same moments, because it's much, much easier to compare them then. And when you compare snapshots, try to find a place uh, when you expect that memory shouldn't be leaked, but well, maybe it is. For example, take a snapshot on a main menu, go to some of the levels, and go back to main menu, take another snapshot, and compare these two. And then uh, you have your data. Uh, this is a screen from this uh, tool uh, that I mentioned about. Uh, it's a heap explorer. And I compared the data between the second main menu, which is the uh, S2, actually. And uh, the last one, when I went back to main menu after skipping through 10 levels. So we see we had a lot of uh, objects. We had. Uh, we have uh, these two snapshots compared. There's a lot of native C++ object, but also C sharp objects, some memory sections that tell you about fragmentation, uh, and also the DC handlers that I talked about. So we see that uh, a memory actually leaks as well. Yeah, so let's go to the uh, meat of this topic, which are the examples. This is, I think, the most common reasons of leaks are found. And these are events, uh, because they seem innocent. Uh, you use them probably to communicate a lot of different systems in your world, uh, to decouple these systems. And you might think that in C Sharp, this, this is a lightweight solution to communicate with uh, such systems. Uh, but actually, uh, we don't have expected pointers, these objects that, um, that uh, point to a specific address uh, in a memory. But if we subscribe to such a delegate, to such event, 
we don't pass a reference to only a delegate method, but actually to the whole object. So we might think that we store here only a, only a method, but the whole object might have a lot of another references that you might end up with uh, that, that, they will, they, that they will leak. Uh, there are many ways uh, for creating events in Unity. These are the native ones, but you can use Unity Actions and Unity Events, and the problem uh, you might find uh, in all of them, actually. So yeah, uh, we've got a simple example, and this is only a broadcaster, which is stored on a scene as a mono behavior, and it only has such event and such delegate that we might want to subscribe to. And we created another class, which is class listener, uh, so it would be easier to understand. And this class stores a reference in editor uh, that we might uh, put in editor for a class broadcaster. And the only thing it makes is just trying to bind events on awake. Well, this one example is, is uh, really simple because uh, I think a lot of you might uh, see what is the problem here. We don't unsubscribe. But actually, it happens quite a lot of time. So remember about it. Um, I, um, I implemented such problem uh, in, uh, in, a test, uh, in a test place. And uh, when you try to compare such, uh, such snapshots between, this, uh, between uh, one place in a game and another place in a game, you can see that we have one count in the first example of both class listener and broadcaster, and another count uh, for a second snapshot, which is on the fifth level. And we see there's uh, plus six of such objects stored in a memory indefinitely. There's plus six, not plus five, uh, even though we loaded only five levels, because uh, there's also one to store um, the actual asset uh, that is stored in a game, not the instance one. Yeah, so uh, I would like to show you also how it looks in, uh, in this tool I use, which is Heap Explorer. So we can see that uh, we've got a lot of such class broadcasters and class listeners, and only respectively uh, two of them have um, have the C++ representations. Because the scene was reloaded, the objects were destroyed, so the C++ representations that I taught before is also destroyed, but the managed one can be collected because of such a reference cycle. So we have only two C++ representations. One, one is for an instance existing on such uh, the fifth scene, and one is for an asset. Let's also look uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we've got, um, uh, we've got this, uh, this a place uh, that we can find references from the object and to the object. On the left one, we can see that the manage one object stores a reference to C++ representation and also the class broadcaster as, as it was in the serialized feed on the top of this class. There's also some garbage on the bottom. Don't, don't look at that, actually. Uh, it was useful to recreate the problem, but uh, not for the actual case. And uh, in the right one, we have a GC handle, which stores a reference to our objects. And we've got also um, a delegate that stores a reference to our class system now. And let's, let's look also for a class broadcaster, which only stores uh, an event and delegates stored in, the, in that event. So we see that uh, this class references to its uh, representative, representative uh, C++ object and to such a delegate. And it is stored by a GC handle and a class listener. And let's look also for a, a delegate, because this is also another object in a C sharp. This delegate is stored uh, by a reference from a broadcaster. And like I said before, it stores re a reference to the whole object of the class list now. So we ended up with this reference cycle. We've got a class list now that has a reference to broadcaster because it tries to subscribe to an event. And the broadcaster stores a delegate, which 
stores a reference to a class in Liftener. So there's a cycle, and it might be collected by AGC, and might be not. It, it's really hard to tell from uh, such a simple example if it will or if it won't be, because it tries to uh, find that reference cycles. It might do that, but it might not, actually. Uh, and we can't know that, so it's better to prepare for such problems and just don't, um, don't make such cycles or cut them when we destroy an object. So the solution is simple. Don't forget to unsubscribe. <laughs> Eventually, you can dereference class broadcaster from class listener, which is uh, by dereference I mean setting to null. So if we cut one of these uh, arrows, that's not a cycle. So that's what it actually means. So yeah, we solved one leak. Let's go to another one. Uh, another one common uh, reason of uh, memory leaks uh, is actually on destroy method. It will only be called on game objects if they have been previously uh, active on a scene. But you might think, how can object never be active? The Unity tell you that uh, it will always invoke the awake function uh, when the object is created, and it will always invoke on destroy function when the object is destroyed. But it's not always true, <laughs> unfortunately, and it's good to not, uh, know that. S because a lot of programmers think of awake and on destroy as a replacement for a constructor and the constructor, and it's it's not true because, well, it's managed. So it's good to read the, the documentation about that, but I will also show you uh, such problem on this example. <coughs> so, for example, we have, uh, we might instantiate an object from a code, and then the awake will always be invoked. But we've got a scene with such uh, simple objects. One is class broadcaster, and one is class listener. And the class listener uh, that I showed you um, in a previous example is inactive uh, from the beginning of the scene. So when you load the scene, these objects are loaded within the scene. And if they're inactive from the beginning, the awake won't be invoked. And if awake is not invoked, on destroy also will not be invoked. So if you had a lot of such objects in your scene, well, you might want that. For example, if you create, um, if you create an UI showing a respective, uh, respective a button respectively to, um, mm, to a console that you make a game for, uh, you might want just to switch these buttons by uh, setting them to active or uh, setting them to inactive. So, I don't say don't use inactive objects on your scene because it's not, of course, possible. But if you have a lot of trash in your scene, try to clean that. And the same problem happens when we have a prefab with such inactive objects. If we instantiate a prefab, uh, we, we load that prefab and instantiate it. And we have, if we have some mono behaviors that are inactive from the beginning, the awake will not be invoked, and also then on this story will not be invoked. So, we have such code. Uh, I use the same example, but with a little change. Uh, we have now class listener that also stores a reference to a class broadcaster. We try to, we fix the problem that was in a previous example, so we try to unbind, uh, unbind from an event. But we also have initialization, which is not uh, invoked on an uh, awake, but from it is set to public, so you can invoke uh, it from external source. So the question is, is there a possible memory leak? Well, of course it is. Uh, the most problematic thing is actually uh, on the left screen. We have on destroy, and it, we have initialized, which can be invoked externally. So. Imagine a situation when um, we try to initialize an object which, is, which will never be active on a scene, so it won't ever invoke on destroy uh, because, uh, because it was never active. So yeah, uh, the solution is if you use external methods for initialization, always try to uninitialize them also externally. Uh, you can't rely then on, a, on destroy, 
because uh, the object might never be uh, awakened. And it's a matter of architecture and code design. For example, if you have a tree-based UI with manager initializing views one by one, initializing entities and so on, you should also uninitialize them the same way from the root of the tree uh, to your leaves. You uh, might want to use awake and on destroy for respectively some kind of initialization and set it, uh, setting up your object and, uh, and then cleaning them, but always use them both or uh, either awake and on destroy or initialize uh, and another uninitialize. So we've got another leak fix. Another example, serialized field hell, referencing everything from everywhere on the scene. We have a simple class with such uh, one field, one member, uh, that we expose to an editor uh, as a serialized field. And we might end up with such a cycle reference. Uh, I explained cycle reference earlier, so you might understand now that uh, we might end up with a, in a leak there. Well, the solution is if you, well, if you have such problems, you actually, the problem is mostly about your code design and architecture of your code, but you, for, if you for some reason can't fix it, just uh, dereference the object, set it uh, to null uh, in on destroy or in, in some other uninitialization method, but it will cut uh, the reference cycle and the objects will be then released uh, by, uh, and collected by a GC. Yeah. Um, like I said, yeah. But actually, don't go insane. Uh, you don't have the reference all your serialized fields. It's not a solution. Uh, if you want to do that, you, like I said, you probably have some problem with the code architecture and not only a simple cycle reference uh, in the one problem in your code. Another example solved. Let's go to the fourth one. Uh, this is very important uh, because uh, let's say something about uh, Unity engine dot objects uh, and what happens when you try to compare them to null. At the first point, we can see that it's not the same as comparing system object to null. There's a whole blog post in Unity that is from 2014. So it's really, really old, but the problem still exists. Unity has a custom equality operator, and if you destroy objects, like I said, the C++ native object is released, but the c -sharp one waits to be collected. But if you destroy object and then compare it to null um, by a simple equality operator, uh, the result will be true, actually. So. Because that's, uh, that's because Unity use it to store some information that we can use uh, in your console log. Uh, and uh, you probab probably might want to use some, um, some members that are also stored in a C++ site, but you won't have access to them because the C++ site is already destroyed. So that's why Unity um, made the decision. You can use another operator, like unit, unary ones uh, or object dot equals, but actually nobody used that because it's not clear, it's not readable, and actually you don't want it because uh, then you might also have to think about what happens when the C++ set of the object is destroyed. But it is a problem, and it might uh, result in a memory leak. So let's imagine uh, another example the similar one to the previous one. Uh, so we have uh, the class listener which references to object to a class broadcaster. We have awake on the soil, bind and bind events. And we have uh, binding events that's subscribing to an event and unbinding uh, with checking if the object is actually null. What we're trying to do is to unsubscribe from a C sharp side of such object. Uh, from a managed one, but we compare to the uh, overloaded operator by uh, operator overloaded by Unity. So 
if something happens that the class load uh, cluster is destroyed uh, in the middle of the scene, comparing to null will compare with this uh, overloaded operator. So it will be true and we can't unsubscribe from such an event. It might be a huge problem uh, because if something is destroyed, we don't have any information about that from such object. Uh, well, it might be reasonable, it might be not, but we probably don't want to mess with that because it happens in another place of your code base. Uh, so, what we can do here? I added only one line here uh, in on destroy, the same one uh, that actually happened in the previous examples. I only set the broadcaster to null, so we don't have a possible cycle reference. It's not a clean solution, but it's the cleanest one we can use. Yeah, so like I said, we can't uh, predict how uh, object will be destroyed, but you can, we can protect from such problems by just referencing, like I said, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, we, we only want to fix the problem and not to fix all the code base we have uh, when we put the game. Another example, a uh, really problematic one, uh, these are lambdas. Lambdas are an uh, anonymous method which I actually don't like. I've seen too many lambdas that uh, were pretty complicated, passing a number, a huge number of parameters that somebody might think of them even as very addict. Uh, and they also make the most uh, difficult leaks to find. Because when you use lambdas, uh, there's something created by a compiler uh, for lambda expressions and statements. And uh, let's go for three examples what can actually uh, be created by a compiler. <coughs> the first example, uh, we have a class lambda, which is mono behavior that can be stored on a scene uh, as a component. We have just simple another class, and we have a member of a function uh, that can store a delegate to uh, something inside this class of also a delegate to, to a lambda. And in a way, we create lambda that only returns a value stored, it, uh, stored uh, in that another class. So the question is, is there a possible memory leak? Well, yes, of course, there might be a memory leak because we reference a member variable in a lambda without passing it as a variable, as we might pass it as a variable in a method. And the lambda we needed creates a delegate referencing to a class lambda as it requires access to another class field in the first line of the class. Moreover, another class is private, so it will need to create some kind of accessor for that. Uh, and on the other side, we create, a, uh, we have this member delegate function that we store for a lambda. So we created a lambda with a reference to class lambda, which has a member feed another class, because we want to return, uh, return that value. But also, in a class lambda, we have a reference to such lambda created in the awake method. So I actually told you about such an example before. It was the first example that I talked about. This is uh, actually the reference cycle. Uh, because of the um, because of subscribing to an event and storing it in another class, like I said, we have class lambda referencing to a delegate and the lambda delegate referencing to a class lambda. Let's see what uh, what we can find in the memory here. Like I said, class lambda referencing to another class and it another member system function and system function referencing to a class lambda. Another example, uh, what might be created uh, when, we, when we use Lambda. So we wanted to fix the problem that we created before, so we pass, uh, pass some variable in a, in a Lambda, and when we use them, we pass another class and this value is stored inside this class. So the question is, have we fixed it? Is there another possible memory leak? Well, actually, no. 
but the, let's remember that something is created behind it. So let's see what actually is created. We have this class lambda that stores two members, like I said, another class and system function. And we have system function, which also is an object. And we can see another symbol uh, on the right that we haven't seen before. It's S for static. Actually, what is created here uh, is a static method created by a compiler stored in this object. So, well, it's not leak because we created it once, but we also created something that we might actually not want because static won't be ever released for a lifetime on the program. So it, it's good to know that we might end up with something created. So let's go to the third example of Lambda. Uh, we have now uh, only one member variable, which is function. And on the wake, we create uh, a simple integer. And we create Lambda returning that integer uh, created in the local scope of a method. And let's see what, was, uh, what has been created here. We have a class lambda with a, on the left, we have a class lambda reference, uh, referencing to a system function. We have a system function that has a reference to something we haven't actually created, which is this C underline uh, underscore display class one underscore O. We haven't created that because actually compiled it. But as we can see and go deeper to this display class that was created, and we can see that it actually doesn't store any uh, reference inside this class. So the thing that we created here is another internal class that is stored inside this class lambda that we used in the beginning. So we have a class lambda having a member with a function, and compiler generated another class stored inside this class that we use. So it doesn't end up in a leak, actually. But it's also good to know what is created here, because if we pretty complicate uh, such example, we might actually end up in a leak. So uh, the solutions to lambdas. It's hard to guess what actually will be created by, uh, at the first look. So it's good to know what can be created and then measure it if we have some problems with lambdas. Uh, and one simple solution and uh, actually a good practice that you could, um, you could use in your code, don't use your class members directly in lambda. It's, it will always create a, a possibility of a leak. And if you have to do that, or you have to fix uh, another programmer's code, you can, as always, keep it simple, stupid, and just reference the function as a member variable. Yeah, so we've got another leak fixed. <laughs> Let's have a little word. But I've got another two examples, and uh, they are pretty simple, actually. Uh, so I think uh, I can go to them faster. So let's talk a little about statics. Uh, statics by themselves, of course, aren't memory leaks. But you should be aware of the data stored in statics. I saw problems in some of the games uh, with uh, pools created as static objects. Let's imagine that we have a static pool uh, that has some objects created from the beginning. And when object is taken from a pool and it's used somewhere in your game, it's somehow initialized. But when object is free, it's restored to the pool at a, uh, at a glance. So let's think about, is there a possible leak? Well, yes, because uh, when we um, take the object back to the pool, we didn't uninitialize it. So it might have some references that we don't want it to have, because we only initialized it why, uh, when taking uh, the object from the pool. So as always, when you think about uh, uh, initialization, some kind of object, at the same time, you should think about uninitialization. And what about native engine objects? You can create native engine objects from code, like render textures to create a view, or textures, or meshes, and or materials. So you might have, um, for example, render textures to create a TV in your game, TV object, rendering events from another part of your game world. 
and you want to show it on your TV and the SRN detectors. So you have to remember when you create native engine in your code, you take responsibility of releasing them manually, manually like, you, uh, like you have to do uh, when you are a C++ programmer, actually. Because that's something that uh, you create is a native object. OK, let's say a word about external plugins. Uh, because they are really problematic, actually, uh, when, you, uh, when you use them and you try to fix your, fix your game in terms of uh, performance and memory performance. So, when you consider uh, using external plugins, uh, instead of creating your own plugin or your own solution, take always, like really always, take into consideration not only what you will benefit from using such plugin, but also the risk of performance and memory usage. Because from my experience, fixing plugins is like 20 to 50 percent of time spent on a porting optimization, depending on the project, of, uh, obviously. And if you need only a smart part of the plugins, really think of writing your a custom solution. For example, you try to use plugin for deserialization, and you use uh, and the plugin can deserialize from a really varied, uh, really great number of types, but you only need uh, a single one. It might be actually better to write your own custom for, uh, solution. Because when you try to think about porting your game or uh, the optimization you have to make, you always, uh, you always treat plugins as a risk, actually. Yeah, so we ended up uh, in a summary. Uh, it's actually a long one because I provided a lot of examples. Uh, so the first one, review code. It's really good to uh, see your code I, I think I don't have to say why code review is useful, but uh, it's also useful in terms of memory optimization because you might want to write a solution. You might think of algorithm you have to make to uh, to create something in your game, but you might don't think uh, memory-wise when um, writing your code. But another programmer looking at the first glance in your code might see some simple example of a leak that might happen in your code. Another general rule that I use, when I, you initialize something, at the same time think of uninitializing as you would do as a C++ programmer. Uh, another one is try to limit Unity, Awake, and on destroy uh, because they might be problematic. Reduce, uh, reduce uh, scene references because between, comp between components in your game. Get to know a difference uh, in the fourth example that I told you about uh, between Unity Engine object null and System object null. Limit lambdas and spe specifically don't pass member variables to lambdas. Uh, when you go into use external Unity plugins, take into consideration not only benefits but also risks. Uh, get to know what happens when you create native objects from your code. And also, some more general one, don't guess. Don't try to imagine what might happen, but profile. If your game crashes because of memory leaks, always profile. Take snapshots. Uh, take it extremely consistent, uh, like I said before. When you use tools, don't profile editor. Always weird, but you don't have to uh, profile on a target platform. You can do that on PC. Get to know your tools and understand garbage collector. These are the references. Uh, you can uh, you can look at them uh, on my Twitter uh, when I release. Uh, yeah, this is my Twitter. <laughs> you can scan that if you want. Uh, I will provide you the slides later. Uh, something about me, hire me, but for AI program, I'm not voting, please, anymore. <laughs> 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 well, I don't have a job right now, I'm looking for one. <laughs> and thank you for... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>